Amen. So keep your place there in Isaiah chapter number 47. We'll get there in just a minute. So this morning, I'm going to preach on a very specific topic, a topic that is all over the Bible, a topic that's all over the Bible. It's talked about everywhere in the Bible. And this topic is brought up in Isaiah chapter 47. We'll get there in just a minute. But this morning, the title of the sermon this morning is Shame and this idea of shame. I want to look at the idea of shame in the Bible. Is shame a good thing? Is shame a bad thing? What should make us ashamed? When are we ashamed? You know, what do we do with this idea of shame? Because the Bible talks about shame everywhere. You know, there's all kinds of common sayings out there where somebody will say to their children, maybe they'll say, shame on you. Or they'll say to somebody that's done something bad to them, shame on you. Or, you know, here's one, like, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You know, things like that. But what is shame? So if you just look at a definition, like just a, a dictionary definition of shame, I mean, it certainly doesn't sound like a good thing. The definition in the dictionary is this. Shame is a painful feeling of humiliation and distress after wrongdoing. That's, I mean, that's the short um, definition. But I mean, I, def, you know, I, I generally agree with that definition of shame. The Bible gets very detailed on shame, but the Bible actually tells us what shame should actually feel like as well. If you look down at Isaiah chapter 47, let me give you an example here. So Isaiah chapter 47 is kind of a, it's a, it's a prophetic um, chapter in the Bible. It's talking about the judgment of a nation. So Isaiah was, um, I don't know, maybe a hundred years or so before the actual Babylonian captivity. And then after the Babylonian captivity, where the children of Judah were taken away um, to Babylon for 70 years, of course, Babylon was overthrown just a few years into that Babylonian captivity, and then the children of Judah became in captivity to the Persian Empire. We're going to talk about that in great detail tonight, okay? But all that to, be, all that to say this, Isaiah, this had not happened. This was 100 years out from when Isaiah was, you know, prophesying Isaiah chapter 47, and he is actually, you know, predicting the fall of Babylon. He's predicting the judgment upon that nation. Now, I want to show you a connection that the Bible makes here on shame. So we're going to do a little bit of a study on shame, what the Bible says about it, because the Bible gives us a very detailed idea of what shame should feel like. And the Bible actually compares shame again and again to nakedness or not having any clothes on, meaning that's what it would feel like to be shamed. The Bible uses that analogy all over. In Isaiah chapter 47, it's using that analogy talking about a nation. Look at verse number one. Look at verse number one of Isaiah chapter 47. Talking about the, the predicting, the prophesying of the judgment of Babylon that has not even happened um, yet. They have not even been taken into captivity. Uh, remember, no nation gets away with anything in the Bible. Yes, Judah was judged by Babylon coming and taking them into captivity, but no nation gets away with anything. Then Babylon was judged by the Persian Empire because of the things that they did to the children of Judah, and just on and on and on. The Bible is very, no nation gets away with anything. Nations are judged on this earth, okay? Look at verse number one of Isaiah chapter 47. The Bible says, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans is another word for, you know, Babylonians. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. So it's, it's comparing this idea of feeling naked and shame. So that's the idea of shame. That's basically how shame will make you feel, is that, you know, you're embarrassed because, you know, you're distressed because, you know, you are without clothing. The Bible uses this example over and over again. Again, verse number three, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man, meaning this is going to be your punishment, this shame. So look, our nation today, our nation, you can see this happening physically in our culture today. I mean, just the idea of the, the shame of nakedness is being taken away in our country today. I mean, you just look at Western culture in general. You look at everything on TV, everything 
on the media, everything on the internet. It's, it's almost like nakedness itself is being celebrated today instead of being you know, ca cast off as something that should be shameful. All right. I mean, individual examples. I was thinking about you know, the Next Generation Youth Conference that we went to this last week. And here you have a bunch of teenagers. You, know, you have just dozens and you know, hundreds of teenagers at this event. And they, are, they look very different from what the world's teenagers look like. They are a group of teenagers that is not embracing you know, the nakedness of this world. You have a bunch of modestly dressed teenagers. It's just a great thing to see because, look, especially for young people, the pressures of media, TV, the internet, social media, all these different things is very real. It is a very real pressure to partake in the culture of whatever the popular culture is of the day. I mean, everything, especially young ladies, I mean, you see modestly dressed young ladies, and there's a young lady who is, is pushing off the popular culture of the day. The popular culture of the day is pushing nakedness everywhere. Everything from women's sports to all kinds of just fashion trends in general is just constantly being thrown in everyone's faces. Why is that? Well, we're trying to remove shame from the society. That is the agenda. And that's what I want to show you this morning. Look at uh, Mark chapter 14. There's plenty of, um, I mean, so you can see that in our culture today, our nation today. That's the connection. That's the connection. It's trying to remove shame from the conscience of our nation. Now, there's many individual examples in the Bible as well, connecting shame and nakedness in the Bible. Look at Mark chapter 14 and verse number 50. Uh, many times you might have read these verses that I'm going to show you and wondered why. Why is that detail in the Bible? That seems kind of weird. But the detail is in the Bible is to show you the shame. That's why it's there. Look at verse number 50 of Mark chapter 14. This is right when Jesus was arrested, and we see this odd little tidbit in the story here that many people are like, why is that in the story? What's that all about? Many people think that this person was John Mark himself. I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But look at verse number 50. It says, and they all forsook him and fled. So everybody ran away when Jesus was, all the disciples that said, we're going to die with you, Jesus, all this. As soon as he's arrested and it gets real, they all take off. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the, young man laid, and the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. So I believe that this is the reason that that detail is in there is because it is showing the shame of what this individual did. It was showing the shame of this individual running away naked. Look at verse number, go to John chapter 21, look at verse number 3. Right after Jesus is crucified, Peter basically quits the ministry. Peter quits the ministry, and he goes off, and he says, you know what, I'm done with this, I'm going fishing. And he takes a bunch of people, and he goes back to his old vocation, even after he had denied the Lord. Look at verse number 3 of John chapter 21. <coughs> Excuse me. The Bible says, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. He was not supposed to go fishing. He was supposed to continue with the ministry that Jesus wanted him to continue, that Jesus had been preparing them for, for three and a half years. They say unto him, we also go with thee. Showing that one person falling spiritually many times brings other people with them. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. This is the resurrected Jesus. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And then Jesus saith unto him, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast forth the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it up for the multitude of fishes. Now look at verse number 7. Therefore that disciple who Jesus loved saith unto Peter, this is John, <coughs> It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. So what the Bible is telling us there is that Peter immediately felt the shame of what he was doing as soon as he saw he knew that it was Jesus. He knew that it was Jesus, and this is very symbolic, showing that he was shamed. He knew he, he shouldn't be doing what he's doing. He saw Jesus. The shame hit him like a ton of bricks, 
And of course, he covers himself up and then goes and gets himself right. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. There's another example in the Garden of Eden. Look at Genesis chapter number 3. Look, I could give you example after example after example of this. I'll just give you a couple more. But the point is this. The, the feeling of shame is the feeling as if you are naked. It's the same embarrassing, distressing feeling. Look at verse number 9 of Genesis chapter 3. Now, they had just disobeyed the Lord. They had just sinned against the Lord. And the Lord, in verse number 9, the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto them, Where art thou? Of course, they're hiding because they didn't have any clothes on. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. This is the beginning of shame right here in the Bible. Verse number 11. And God says this, look, he, and he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And of course, they did eat of the tree that they were not supposed to eat of. But what is the first thing that happened to them? They literally felt shame, and they felt naked at that time. So shame is the feeling of being naked. It's always, to, many times those things are together in the Bible. In Exodus chapter 28, verse number 40, 42, the Bible commands that, you know, our nakedness should be covered from the loins unto the thighs, meaning, you know, from your belly button to your knees, that's your nakedness, that should be covered. That's why it's embarrassing naturally if those things, those parts are uncovered in the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, David's men, David's men were captured and their, half their beards were shaved off and then half their clothes you know, were, were cut off. And it says, you know, so their buttocks were exposed, it says in the Bible. And it, what does it say? It says they were greatly ashamed. They felt great shame because of that nakedness. So look, so you have to ask yourself the question, where is this desire to be naked? Like physically, where does it come from? What is the agenda to this, for this desire for something that should make you feel shameful? Look, because the shame of nakedness, folks, I hope I can, uh, got you to see this, the shame of nakedness is a sign of an intact conscience, something that God gave you at birth. God gave you, he wrote in your heart. That's why many times, many times I've heard the example used, and I think this is a great example, many people ask, well, when can my children, when will my children, what age will my children um, get saved? What age can my children understand the gospel? And really, the, the main milestone in a child's life is not the milestone of understanding the gospel, because the gospel itself is very simple. But the main milestone for a child getting saved is understanding the shame of their sin. Because, and many people have used this example before, what do little kids do, like one-year-olds and two-year-olds? They don't have any shame about not having any clothes on. And I've always been annoyed with parents that just let their kids run around with no clothes on. But the point is, is that when children are very young, they just have no shame about it. They can just run around. But there is a point that will just naturally occur where children will realize, hey, hey I, I need to have clothes on. And that is showing you that conscience coming alive in their hearts and showing that shame and showing that they are now able to be aware of their sin. And it's a great example. It's kind of a, the example of Adam and Eve in the Bible. But look, the problem is this. The problem is when, you know, you have been taught to go against that conscience and where you should be ashamed, you simply don't care. And this is what's happening in our society today. And that's why nakedness is being pushed so hard today. It is an agenda to remove shame. Look, and if you look at the end of Isaiah chapter 47, I'll just paraphrase it for you. But if you look at the, the beginning of Isaiah chapter 47 is, look, you are going to be exposed. God is going to expose you. He's going to shame you. But then if you look at the end of the chapter, what do you see? You see actual consequences. You see evil is going to come upon you. Evil is going to come upon you. See, this is the problem. If you don't have shame where you should have shame, the consequences are still coming. Shame is like an early warning system. But 
this has to be undone in a person. It has to be removed in a person. Because shame, as Romans 2.15 says, it comes with your conscience. It comes with the package. God wrote it in your heart. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me show you some examples today of the agenda against shame today. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse number 14. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 14. There is a definite agenda to try to remove shame today. And it's not just, you know, it, the, the nakedness in the culture is just a big sign of it. But there's many other examples. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 14. Look what the Bible says here. The Bible's talking about men and how long their hair should be. You think, does the Bible get specific about things? The Bible's very specific about things. The Bible says that not even, even nature itself, you always have to remind yourself and underline that word nature in the Bible when it talks about, you know, nature itself, against nature, all these different things. It's talking about your conscience. It's talking about the natural state of what God gave you in your heart. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is what? What's that word? It is a shame unto him. So the Bible is literally saying here that a man with long hair is a shame. And that is something, look, that is something that needs to be undone. That is a natural thing. That is a natural thing. If you just left people alone, most men would have short hair, and most men, most men and there was no Bible, most men would not have long hair. Why? Because it's natural. Every man sees you know, something, and in verse number 15, it says that a woman having, it gives the other side, it says a woman having short hair and a woman having long hair, it, the natural thing is for a woman to have long hair, it says in verse number 15. It says it's a glory unto her. Why? Naturally. Nature. It's in your conscience. All right, so look, and, and it's so funny because when, it, when you look at the woman with short hair, or the women with long hair issue, I've been watching this for 30 years as you watch, you know, you read media and you read the news and all, everything like this. The funny thing is, they're, they'll do polls on this. Like secular studies will be done on this, on if men prefer women with long hair or short hair. And it is always overwhelmingly men prefer women with long hair. And it's usually like long, wavy hair or something dramatic. But why is that? And then they, they try to come up with all these secular reasons for it. You know, it's the culture, whatever. No, it's nature. It's nature itself. It's the same thing. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse number 5, it's the same exact thing with men and women's clothing. Exactly the same thing. If you look at Deuteronomy 22 and verse number 5, the Bible says this. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 22, verse number 5, the Bible says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. I mean, the Bible here is very clearly saying, that's why when a normal man sees another man like wearing a dress, it's like it's repulsive. It, like, it, just, it, just, it, it just gives you like a reflex that you're just disgusted with it. Not, well, not a Bible-believing Christian, anyone. It's a natural reaction because... Nature teaches us that one thing is natural and the other thing is not natural. Now, tell me there's not an agenda there. Right. Tell me there's, I mean, unfortunately in the 80s, I, I mean, I'll confess my sins to you, unfortunately in the 80s I watched a lot of movies. And I always thought it was weird that you would watch a movie that was like some action movie or something, and all of a sudden the character, the lead character would like have a scene where he has to like wear a dress or something. But what, what's the agenda? The agenda is to get you to erase shame. The agenda is against shame. The agenda is against the conscience. It's the same thing with immodest clothing everywhere. There's a bunch of actors out there that, that have said like for years that there's a conspiracy uh, to get like every actor, every male actor to wear a dress at one point in his career. And there's some of them that are like just like, I'll never do it, ever. They're not Christians. They're just like, I'm not doing it, it's unnatural. You know, they don't know the Bible. They're just saying it's unnatural. Why are you pushing this agenda? Well, the agenda is to remove shame from the culture. That is the agenda in all these different things. It's the same thing with immodest clothing. You take some young lady, you take a 20-year-old young lady who has been raised to respect herself, 
to respect the Bible, to understand that she is not just, you know, there to just show her nakedness to everyone at, the, at any time and for any reason in every sport she does and any activity she does. Somehow, for some reason, all the girls' sports, they all have to be naked. Why is that? Naked meaning you're exposing your nakedness. That your nakedness is exposed from the, you know, from the, the loins to the, the knees. Why is that? They're trying to remove the shame. That's why. And they successfully do it. But you take somebody that has been raised to respect themselves and dress like a lady and dress modestly and cover their nakedness. And you say, okay, now wear this to the beach and, and show them what everyone wears to the beach. There's no way they would do it. They'd be like, I'm not wearing that. Because their conscience is intact. That's why. They haven't had that attack for years and years and years from the culture around them removing that shame from them. Turn back to Genesis chapter 3. <coughs> so look, I'm here to tell you this morning that shame is good. Shame is good. Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 7. You say, how, Pastor, how could shame be good? Shame is good because it prompts action. That's why it's good. Look at verse number 7 of Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says this. It says, And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew. They knew that they were naked. This is the shift right after they sinned. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Look, in this case, they felt shame, and because they felt shame, they immediately took action. That is the purpose of, of shame. And that is the danger if shame is removed from individuals and especially a nation. That's how shame should work. It should be faced, it should be felt, and it will be dealt with. I mean, if you have shame immunity, that is a dangerous place to be in your life because the consequences, as Isaiah 47 shows, are still coming. They're still there. Shame is like the, the, the warning light that goes off before the actual, you know, gate slams shut or the consequences actually come in to play. But look, shame is not comfortable. And this is the problem. Shame is not comfortable, and we live in a society where we have to remove every discomfort in our life. Nobody can be uncomfortable in America today. But no, you should be uncomfortable in certain situations. Shame is not supposed to be comfortable by design. It's painful by design, so you don't want to repeat things. So you don't want to do things again. So look, shame is powerful. It stops trouble. And most people, look, most people do something. The consequences of sin are coming, especially if you get caught. Most people will feel shame. And that is a good thing. It causes shame. But guess what? The society that is able to remove shame will be a society of chaos. And the Bible has an example of that too. Turn to Judges chapter 21. This has happened in the Bible. This has happened. There's been a society of the nation of Israel. They were at a time in history where their society was complete chaos. You say, why is that? Look, Judges, many people will read through the Bible and they'll read Judges and they'll go into the Judges and they'll read the stories in Judges and they'll be like, what in the world? Look, when you read those stories in Judges 19, when you read those stories at the end of the book of Judges especially, that's not what God wanted to happen. That's just what happened. And you say, why is that? I mean, look at Judges chapter 21 and verse number 25. The Bible says, the Bible tells us why in Judges chapter 21 and verse number 25. The Bible says this, after all you read through all of these stories in Judges, you read up, you read about, you know, the violent society. You read about all the murderous, um, you know, perversion that was going on in Judges. And you read about that and you're like, how in the world could it have gotten to that point? Well, look at verse number 25. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Shame is a feeling of distress from what? From wrongdoing. And everybody had their own idea of what wrongdoing was and what it wasn't. 
shame had been erased from this society. And that's what you get. When, so you look at our society today, we don't want to offend anybody today. We don't want to say anything shameful today. You know what that will lead to? That will lead to murderous perversion and violence. The Bible teaches that again and again and again. Massive wars in Judges. Just extreme loss of life. Hundreds of thousands of people being killed over these things. But shame was destroyed first. So look, we need to prever preserve shame today in our society. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me give you a couple examples of our society today where shame has been completely destroyed. Like it's almost completely gone. Today, in 2024 America. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse number 18. An area where shame is completely destroyed today is fornication. Fornication. What is fornication? Fornication is a physical relationship between a man and a woman outside of marriage. This has been almost completely destroyed today. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 18. The Bible says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Look, you're shaming yourself. You're shaming yourself in fornication. Let me give you some stats today in the United States. Now, marriage, and marriage, here's some all-time highs. Marriage ages for men have never been higher, above 30 at this point. The amount of people, percentages of people that are not getting married has never been higher today. But are people, are people just like not having relationships with people? No, people are fornicating. That's what they're doing. And this is what's killing marriage today. Something interesting happened in 2013 as far as a, a shift goes. In 2013, you know, all these numbers have been getting higher and higher as shame is being destroyed, you know, further and further with fornication in this country. But in 2013, there was more people that were cohabitating, not married, than there was people that were actually married in the country. That's when it flipped. There's literally more people in the United States today living together outside of marriage than there are people that are actually married today. The percentage of people that say that living together before marriage is not acceptable the percentage of people today that will say that it is not acceptable is 14%. The Bible is, super, is not gray on this. The only way to have a proper physical relationship with a man and a woman is through the God's institution of marriage. That is the only acceptable way, yet 14% of Americans believe that. Shame is being destroyed. But what about the consequences? Are the consequences being destroyed? No, you know what's being destroyed? The family is being destroyed. The family structure, and what's the purpose of a family? What's the purpose of a dad and a mom and a grandma and a grandpa? You know what the main purpose of that is? Is to raise children and protect those children. Amen. So who suffers? Who suffered in judges? Who suffered? You know, it's the women and children that always suffer when these things are done when these societies are created. Now, in the 1960s, most of you aren't old enough to, to know this, but if you just read on this, in the 1960s, there was something that was put forth by LBJ called the Great Society. You would think that secular people would be able to figure this out at this point, because we have a lot of data. The Great Society greatly expanded this idea of welfare in the country. And it greatly pushed this idea of welfare support for children born to mothers outside of marriage. It basically removed shame and incentivized this situation where children could be born outside of wedlock. If you look at a graph that we have all the way back to the 40s of children born outside of wedlock up until 1940 to about 1960, it's pretty flat, even amongst most eth ethnic groups. It's pretty flat, you know, below 20%, or right around that 20%. So it was, a, it, was a more, it was a less common thing. Then right around 1960, you see this hockey stick go up. You say, why is that? Why is it? You'd think people would figure this out. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to read a graph, to read statistics on what's actually happening. See, 
A solution that makes the problem worse is not a solution. This is the problem with all these wicked policies. They make the problem worse in every single way. It's to the point where Latino and black families, or Latino and black, 70% of those children are born outside of wedlock. 70%. We removed shame and we destroyed people's families. That's what this great society did. And then, of course, it flattens out up at 70%. And most people think it flattens out right around 2000, 2010. And, but it only flattens out not because people aren't fornicating, but because of birth control and abortion. Some great society. You say, what's the answer? What's the answer? Return to shame is the answer. Make America shameful again. That's the answer. Quit covering up shame and face shame. Look it in the face. But see, nobody wants discomfort today. So we remove all discomfort from people. But look, if you keep shame, you will have less of it. That's the nature of shame. I mean, you got to think about this when you're raising your kids. You need to preserve shame for your kids today. What do, I, what do I mean by that? When you see something that's shameful, you point that out. When you drive by a 30-year-old man standing on a corner with two arms and two legs, holding a sign saying, give me money, you point out to your kids, that's shameful. That man should be working. He should be working or he should be starving. That's what the Bible says. You need to preserve shame with your children. This is why people don't discipline their children. Because they don't want to face the shame. Because when your kid does something, especially in public, in front of other people, it's shameful. It's easier just to pretend like it didn't happen and shove it under the rug. But look, the more you ignore shame, the more serious it gets. The more you ignore shame, the more and more people that are going to be shamed. The more you ignore shame, the more permanent it is going to get. Because look, when some kid is, is three years old and he does something you know, bad that three-year-olds do, you told him no and he knew that and then he goes and he does it anyway, and then he gets a spanking for that or she gets you know, a spanking for that or whatever, yeah, you know, that might be shameful for five minutes. But when people ask you where how your kids are doing and you're like, well, they're in, they're in prison for life because they murdered somebody or they, got, or they were a drunkard and they got in a car and they killed somebody's family, that shame will never go away. You take care of shame early and it will be quick and it will be a tool that you can use to preserve shame for our children. And when you see all these things, you, you know, the nakedness and the culture and all this, you tell your kids, that's shameful. And then they will feel that, how shameful that is and when they become a teenager and they start to run on their own. And they will keep that conscience intact. Look, face the shame. I know, like when your kids do something, you think my kids have never done something dumb? You think my kids haven't embarrassed me in public? Everybody's kids embarrass them in public. Everybody's kids throw a fit in the grocery store. Everybody's kids do something bad. Everybody's kids, you know, do bad things. It's you either face the shame or you ignore the shame and make it worse. Face it. And then their conscience will stay intact and they will grow up to, to make you proud and not ashamed of them. It only gets worse. Look at your bulletin. Look at your bulletin in the verse of the week. See, Jesus himself faced shame. Jesus faced shame. Why can't we? Jesus faced shame that wasn't even his. Your shame is yours. When you do something, when you do something that makes you ashamed, that's your fault. That's one of the reasons it's so distressing. I can't imagine what it was like facing the shame for what other people had done. We need to bring back shame. This country's walking around naked, spiritually and physically. 
and no one realizes it. Lies. Lies, cause, lies should cause you shame. You ever, you ever met somebody that lies about something? Maybe it's something stupid and small. And they're obviously lying about it. And then they just keep like lying and lying and lying to just cover it up. What does it do? It just becomes more and more shameful to them. And the consequences just become greater and greater. So maybe they've even destroyed their name permanently with people. Get it right. Shame is a tool that God has given us. You know, it, it's to help us stay right with God. Look at Hebrews 12 too. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. You see that? He didn't like it. He didn't like it. That's what's so weird about people, somebody that would have a crucifix image in their house. It's like the most shameful point in someone's life, and we're just going to like put it over our mantle. That's not your friend. He despised the cross. He despised the shame, but he felt the shame and he faced the shame. And it's better for him because it wasn't even his. He faced it because of what we did. That's why he had to despise that shame. But it's not supposed to feel good. It is a tool for us. So yes, the answer is shame is good. It's not comfortable. It's good. When you feel shameful, deal with it directly. God has put it there so you can deal with it directly. Shame is a tool that God has given us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.